Now, this is just a study guide sheet that I use and I'll be speaking from. You don't have to use them if you don't want. It just gives you room on the, on the edges around the scripture to write notes. <clears throat> and on the back, uh, because we're going to be looking and concentrating on promises of scripture, uh, rewards uh, that God has promised to us, and see, commands, we're going to look at commands, promises, and rewards. <clears throat> Excuse me. Back in October, as we were doing, starting our learning how to use the inductive Bible study method. Thanks, guys. Did you keep one for yourself? There you go. We, we know back in the October when Brenda and I and a group of people that we were uh, meeting with and we're all learning how to use this inductive Bible study method, we began to notice that wherever God gave a command, very good, thank you, my man. Where God gave a command, he also gave a promise following that that helped understand the command or be able to do the command or, um, in other words, God was saying, if you'll do this, here's what I will do. A command, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, God offering us a command. He said, and I'm going to come alongside you. Here is my promise. And sometimes following that, there is the biblical reward, the reward that God has for us for being obedient. And we begin to see that pattern, so we developed this sheet. And that's why we made it on the back and adapted it into inductive Bible study that, where we could work with the commands, promises, and rewards. We found that to be a very powerful way to study Scripture. And Scripture just began to be really become alive. It's not that it wasn't alive before, but in the last uh, four months, starting in October, wouldn't you say, Brenda, uh, Scripture's just really becoming alive to us, uh, me and my wife, and the study group that we're in. And uh, following along with Matthew, uh, we've been doing this, and Matthew has just come alive. I've seen Matthew in a way I've never, ever seen it or experienced it before. So let's jump right in. Um, setting the stage. And I'll so in these chapters, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, and we're in 4, Matthew is setting the stage for the Beatitudes, which are going to be coming up in chapter 5. And he did this by having us look at four different groups of people. I'd say groups, four little sets of people. In chapter one, uh, past the genealogy part, but looking at Joseph and Mary. So when we look at Joseph and Mary, we just did, we asked the why question. When you get to interpretation, you get to ask why. <laughs> Goes back to the childhood, you know, when you're a child and your mom gives, a, dad gives you a command, you know that. Why? <laughs> well, we found that a very good uh, thing to ask in Scripture. We came up with some, uh, some interesting things. Why did God pick Joseph and Mary? And what were some of their characteristics? We're just going to run through some of this stuff real quickly. Uh, Joseph and Mary had a very deep engagement with God. If you go to Luke chapter 1, we're not going to take that time. But we see that Mary had this incredible knowledge of God and a very deep engagement with God for her to come up and say the things that she did in Luke chapter 1. Joseph and Mary were well studied in scriptures. They knew the Bible well. Um, they were very familiar with God's presence. When the angel came and spoke to Mary, spoke to Joseph, they weren't afraid. They, uh, they were very spiritually sensitive. And one of the great jobs of Mary and Joseph was, uh, scripture doesn't talk about it per se, uh, is if we go back to Deuteronomy, and let, why don't we just do that now? We have a reference to Deuteronomy later on in the text. But Deuteronomy chapter 6 turns out to be the most important job that Mary and Joseph had in raising Jesus, and that is to teach him the scriptures. Jesus learned the Bible the same way we do, <laughs> by studying it, by memorizing it, by having a book in front of us, by going through line by line and talking. And, and, and the Jews, and particularly Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, really did church around the table well. Only they did it every day, morning, night, throughout the day. Deuteronomy 6, starting with verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. 
You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as a frontlet between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Jesus had so well mastered the scriptures. Now understand, he had a, 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 a little bit better mind than we do. It wasn't all clogged up with sin. But by the time he was 12, he had mastered the scriptures, and he sat in the temple, according to Gospel of Luke, confounding the very wisest of the priests in the temple. That's how well he had learned. And so that came about because every day they had church around the table. I would love to have been there and watched that. Can you see that? Uh, okay, children, let's put away all the dishes and do the dishes. And today we get to study the book of, oh, I'll pick Ezekiel. Today we get to study Ezekiel. Jesus is going, oh, great, I love the book of Ezekiel. Let's get after it. And all his brothers are going, oh, Ezekiel again? Ah. Can you just feel the tension? <laughs> But what a joy it must have been to Mary and Joseph that at least one of their kids really loved the Bible and loved to study it. All right, don't want to take any more time on that. Just think on that for a bit. Chapter 2. <laughs> Just goes back to my days when my dad was a pastor. And we had family devotions, and me and my brother, we were just naughty. Okay, moving right on, Matthew chapter 2. This is the supernatural, divine, uh, interface chapter of the book of Matthew. There is more divine interaction in chapter 2 of, of the wise men being led by the star, the wise men uh, being led by God in dreams, Mary and Joseph being led by God in dreams. And so in chapter 2, verse 2, The wise men say, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have seen his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. And so we look through this, we, that is the study group we're in, and we came up with three things that we saw over and over again. God seeking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have seen his star as it rose, divinely led. We have come to worship him spiritually sensitive. That is repeated, that pattern is repeated five times in chapter two. We got the idea that that's the pattern for the book of Matthew. And we'll, we'll pick that up here in, in next. All right, chapter three. Chapter three is about John the Baptist. We see he had a deep engagement with prayer and scriptures. He was willing to pay a high price to be obedient, calling sinners to repent. He studied in the desert instead of studying in Jerusalem. If he would have studied in Jerusalem with all the rigmarole, the temple, and the corruption of the temple, and all that stuff, his whole ministry would have been totally gone astray. But because he studied out in the desert, without all the distractions, with all the politics, without all the other things, he willingly studied in the desert for 30 years since he was a very little child. And he developed this incredible passion for God that was willing, that made him willing to just confront sin at every level and call the ruling class a brood of vipers. <laughs> you bunch of snakes. And he was willing to go to Herod and say, you have sinned. If he just would have kept his mouth shut, he would have stayed out of prison. But he was willing to call every man to repentance, including Herod. Herod put him in prison, later took his head off. So he studied for 30 years to minister for what we think six months and spend another six months in prison, and then his head's off. That's a pretty high price. He had a deep passion for God that gave him great boldness. All right, Matthew's given us a picture here. Jesus in the temptation, chapter 4, just before our lesson here today. 
we see that Jesus, um, um, this, there's other things that we could talk about here, but we see that Jesus had a total understanding of and a complete obedience to Scripture. There was absolutely no self on the throne of his heart. The Father was fully in charge. The, the, the temptation is not about, Jesus, are you really God? The temptation is, since you are God and you have all these special supernatural powers, how are you going to use them? The temptation was, hey, you got these special supernatural powers. You're hungry. You could just make that bread. But see, him going over there and using that and just making that bread wasn't God's plan. So he stuck to God's plan and just quoted scripture, which was God's plan. See, Satan, Satan would have loved if in one of these three temptations that Jesus would have slipped just a little bit. Because Satan then could go to God and say, hey, see, your own son can't even live up to your commands. Satan was so hopeful Jesus would slip up just a little bit. I'm glad he didn't. <laughs> I'm really glad he, he was obedient to the Father's will. And uh, all right. This takes us up to Matthew chapter 4. All right, so here's what we take away from that. Go to the next slide, Jim. All right. The book of Matthew is not for wimps. There is more about how to walk in the kingdom and have a personal relationship with God in the book of Matthew than the other gospel writers. Matthew concentrates on the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and how to live within those realms. Matthew understood his fellow Jews were so intent on knowing God intellectually, being able to quote the law, speak the law, uh, be doctrinally correct, that they missed out on experiencing God personally. So he's writing his book and all the things that are coming up in the Beatitudes and on are very experiential in nature that if we will work with those things coming up, your, my life will be incredibly changed. So Brandon and I have set a little goal. All the commands in the book of Matthew and all the promises and all the rewards, we're going to pray over day by day, week after week for this whole next year because a year from now, January next year, Brent and I said, we want our lives changed. And I am convinced, based on what we see here already in these first four chapters, if we're willing to follow the pattern of Mary and Joseph, the wise men, John the Baptist, and Jesus himself, and really applying the scriptures and being experiential, having an experiential walk with God, our lives will become like theirs. Very different from the norm of the world. All right. Did I cover everything? It covers time, determination, and prayer, spiritual overhaul, lifestyle change. Good. All right. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. And that's where we're going to pick up from these sheets. You can follow along in your Bible if you want. I just like these sheets. just gives me more room to write notes. There is one guy on the internet that does all these things that we're doing here, and he does it in, a, in his Bible, and uh, uh, we can talk about that later. And I really love what he does. I love how he teaches everything about it. I just find it easy for me to have this piece of paper. But if you write in your Bible all that well and good, there's other people who do that to a very great um, um, benefit. All right, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, I'm going to read this first paragraph here, and then we'll start doing an observation. Uh, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth and then left there and moved to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah, 
in the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali, beside the sea, beyond the Jordan River, in Galilee, where so many Gentiles live. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. That comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Let's take a look at that. Isaiah 9 has also got other verses that are very familiar to you, that are prophetic in nature, verse, like verse 6. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. We're familiar with those verses. But this here, verses nine, uh, chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. I had to do a little history work here. Go to the next slide, Jim. There we go. Up in northern Israel is, is the area of, of um, Zebulun and Naphtali. And there in Zebulun, you see Nazareth. And Capernaum on the top side of the Sea of Galilee. Here's, here's what history tells us. Uh, you go to Sea of Galilee, see that kind of river valley, small lake going up there? That going north is the major thoroughfare highway for all the people in trade coming in and out of Palestine. That's the road that the Assyrians came down when they took the northern kingdom captive in around 720 B.C. That's the road that Nebuchadnezzar and all his armies came down when they came down and took out Jerusalem in roughly 580 one, 582, whatever it was, B.C. When the armies came through, that region of Naphtali was like the first ones that were destroyed by the enemy. That region of northern Israel suffered more from the wars than any other part of the country. So when Jesus, so when Matthew picks up the narrative here, and he points this out. The other writers don't. But when Matthew points this out, Matthew is saying, Jesus is going to go where the need is the greatest and where it is the least evangelized of all the parts of the country. So Jesus had just been to Jerusalem, and he had started his ministry by clearing the temple. Great way to start your ministry, right? Get everybody mad at you. <laughs> I would have loved to have been there and watched that. He cleared the temple, tried to do some miracles, tried to do some teaching. Wasn't a great response. All right, so let's talk about when John, okay. Uh, okay, so, but when he came north and started preaching in this area of the nation of Israel, the response was amazing. His greatest miracles, his greatest teachings, the most time that he spent was in the northern kingdom. It's where he had the best crowds, the best everything. And that's where Matthew spends most of his time of Jesus' ministry in the northern half of the country. The Gospel of John. Uh, John uh, spends most of his time in the southern part of the country around Jerusalem and the Jordan. Um, Mark and Luke have about a half and half. All right. When John had been arrested, he left. Uh, when John had been arrested, uh, that's in Mark chapter 6, and we're not going to go there. So John had been arrested. Jesus had already been in ministry, and some people say up to a year already, maybe eight months. Some say six months. We're not really sure. Uh, wherever John the Baptist preached, if John the Baptist was in the north part of the country, Jesus was in the south. And that way it kept the disciples of John the Baptist and the disciples from Jesus from saying things like, which Scripture tells us, saying things like, we, uh, uh, we baptized more people than you did. So... To keep that bickering down, 
John the Baptist preached here, Jesus went up here. If John the Baptist went up here, Jesus went down here. So when John had been arrested, Jesus had been down in, in, in Judea, and he came up to Capernaum. He went first to Nazareth. And, and Nazareth, you remember, is where he went into the uh, tabernacle, read from Isaiah uh, chapter, I think it was about 56 or 60, somewhere in there. And uh, the people didn't like it. They grabbed him and rushed him out of the temple, went up to the top of the hill, took him over the cliff. They were going to throw him out over the cliff. And Jesus walked through uh, the midst of them and continued on. Uh, that's happened there. Luke talks about it in chapter 4. He went to Nazareth and there and then moved to Capernaum. And, and the ministry began that I've talked about. So on the, on the side here, under observation, we just put a little line over here, and we just kind of summarize that. And in summary, Jesus goes to the area of greatest need and opportunity. On the back there, under commands, the command is implied in Matthew 28, verses 19, 20, where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. And here's how we would want to, here's one of the questions we would want to uh, I want to ask God about that. Ask God to show you and show us someone who is in darkness who is looking for spiritual light. So if we go back to that first part there, people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. The land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. And, and when this was written, Jesus was this light. Today, we are the light of the world. The promises is that if we, uh, Jesus said the people have seen a great light. And he was talking about to himself there, but in Matthew 5, we're going to see it later on. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. So the light shifts from him. The light is now inside, inside us. Let our light shine before men. Let's go on to the next promise there. And uh, uh, command, promise, and reward found in verse 17. Just a little one-line paragraph. From then on, Jesus began to preach Repent of your sins and turn to God. There's our command. And the kingdom of heaven is near. That's our promise. And we don't have our reward there, but we're going to look at it here in just uh, a minute. So that's pretty straightforward. Jesus' main message when he starts and all through his ministry, his message is repent, turn from your sins, and turn to God. The kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus all through Matthew is explaining the king, all, all those parables that he's going to talk about. The kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven is like that was his main message. Repent. The kingdom is near. All right. So under let's look at that command. Repent of your sins and turn to God. There's a number of verses which you all know and are well aware of that speak to that. John 3, 16, 1 John 1, 9, Romans 10, 9 and 10. How we would work with that in our daily life is, are there any sins in me that I have not confessed and repented of? You know what the answer to that is? Of course. <laughs> I'm only laughing at myself. <laughs> of course there's sins that I don't know about or there's sins that I do know about. Okay, God, I'm holding on to this one because this is my pet. I kind of like this one. The kingdom of heaven is near. Here's what the kingdom of heaven, I just wrote a short definition. The realm where God lives, where God is in charge, where all that live there all live and operate in perfect relationship with him and do his will perfectly. You know the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, his kingdom has come to earth, but his will isn't being perfectly done here yet. But it, in our lives, that's our goal to work with. All right, here's the reward. The reward is found in John chapter 5, verse 26. We have time. Let's go there. John gives us more information on the tangi uh, on, on the reward of following Jesus and entering into his kingdom and accepting this offer of invita invitation. 
John 5, 26. Let's find that verse. This one verse here sets the catalyst for the whole Christian life. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. The word life there in Greek is zoe. There's only one word in all the Bible for eternal life. It's this word from this chapter right here. The Father has that eternal life in himself. It originated with him. It's always been with him. It will always be with him. It is his life. The Greek scholars gave it one word, zoe. If you're a Bible scholar, it's Strong's vocabulary, two, 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 two. You go to Google, type in Strong's two, 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 two. Zoe comes up. I laugh because Bible college did not teach me that. But a friend of mine who was a pastor did. There's 276 references to Zoe in the New Testament, eternal life. Half of them are in the book of John. It is the life of the Father implanted in us. So once that happens, we have his DNA infused in us. We will never be the same again. That different DNA grafts us into the vine and we will always be his child. Now there's some theological issues. People want to argue back and forth. But the scripture does not seem to give any indication that once we have his DNA in us, he takes it back. Okay, uh, John 10, 28. This next one is important. Uh, the great, great joy of being a Christian is walking with Jesus and the Father. John 10, 28. And I give them eternal life. That's that word, zoe. So, so the father gives zoe to, had it in himself. He gives it to the son. It says, okay, Jesus, you can give my eternal life to whomever. You choose, and I give them zoe, eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Chapter 17, verse 2 and 3 of John. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life, that's that word zoe, to as many as you have given him. And this is zoe, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus whom you have sent. See, that's the crown joy of being a Christian. Knowing God, feeling his presence, being in relationship with him and through the Son. Okay. Moving on. One day Jesus, was, I love this next part. Here's my favorite. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of Galilee. You know what? Uh, this just came to me. Have you ever been at a revival service, at a preaching service where the pastor gave the invitation first and then the preaching? <laughs> That's what Matthew is doing. He's giving the invitation to the gospel and, and saying, here, respond. You don't even know what the gospel is, but respond. I just thought that funny. Okay, chapter 18, uh, verse 18. One day as Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. And Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me. All right, here's our command. I will show you how to fish for men. That's the promise. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. 
and he called them to come to. They immediately followed him, left their boat, and their father behind. This is one of the verses of the Bible I've probably struggled with in previous years. Almost my whole life I've struggled with this verse. Not about coming and following Jesus, but I will show you how to fish for men. When I was a young Christian, some of my friends went around with this little track called the Four Spiritual Laws. And they witnessed the people and, and they maybe led some people to the Lord. I'm not really sure. I thought I'd try it one day. I had to track four spiritual laws. And it was a total disaster. I, I was totally embarrassed. I did not do a good job. Or I did the best I could. And it was a horrible experience. And I was so ashamed for years, saying, dear God, I'll try to do whatever you want me to do, but I, I, I just... I'm just not leading people to you. I don't know how to fish for men. Thankfully, today, we're going to have a better understanding of what this means. And as I began, and even just the last couple of years starting, uh, when I t went to take care of my mom, my whole paradigm started to shift about what it means Come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for men. Here I am taking care of my dying mom, washing dishes, while she's listening to this pastor on TV falling totally asleep. And I'm going, dear God, is this really following you? And God says, yes, it is. You are fishing for men, taking care of your dying mother washing dishes. This is where I placed you right now. I'm telling you, the liberation in my heart that started. Is so I'm so glad. All right, let's unpack this a little bit. A little personal note there. All right, on the back. Here's our command. Come and follow me. All right, so this goes back to Jesus and the temptation in the wilderness. Here's how we would work with that. What part of self is left on the throne of my heart that has not been confessed and removed? That's where we go to God and ask that in prayer. We have to pray that prayer. God, what part of self, what part of myself is still on the throne that's still there I haven't confessed and removed? God is so gracious. He'll show you in a way that's going to be very loving very kind, and it's like he comes up and puts his arm around you and said, hey, Dan, let me show you a little something here. Let's work on it together. <laughs> you see, I can't take self off the throne, only he can. That's why we got to work together on this. All right. I will show you how to become... And he used the context, fisher and men. He was talking to fishermen. So in each one of our lives, he's going to come to us and say, I'm going to show you how to become. First, he wants to show us how to have a great relationship with the Father and with him. And then he's going to show us how to take our time, our energies, our talents, our individual personalities, and use them in such a way in his kingdom that it benefits his kingdom. All right, so we have some biblical examples. So as we prayed over this, we said, God, give me some examples. All right, we're almost done. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. This whole thing about the kingdom of God is Genesis, what happened in Genesis chapter 2 is being restored. The life of us walking with God in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden, that fellowship that Adam and Eve had, but tossed aside, God is now restoring. That's what the kingdom of heaven is all about. That perfect interaction with the Father. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. I love these verses. I never saw this before. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of knowledge and good and evil you shall not eat. All right, so, so on. Um, 
Okay, down to verse 19. Here's the part I love. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. What an incredible interaction. Every day, God and Adam are walking out in the field and God is saying, Hey, Adam, I got some, some things I want you to name today. And can, can you see the fun Adam had with a giraffe? <laughs> so this giraffe comes ambling by and God says to Adam, Adam, what are you going to call this thing? And Adam goes, God, that is the craziest looking animal you have ever created. I have no idea. So can you see this every day? God and Adam are talking back and forth. What do we, see, and it's all in context of work, isn't it? So there's, God says, I got this job for you to do, Adam. And God said, I'm going to come alongside. I'm going to help you. And we're going to get some work accomplished. And I'm just going to be an advisor. But I want you to be interactive in this work. And we're going to work together. What a great picture of. I will show you how to become that which God wants us to do. All right. We talked about Joseph, Mary, and Jesus in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Jesus remembered all the happy times in his childhood and, a, and growing up, sitting around a table, talking through the scriptures with, with Mary and Joseph. And he says, as I went back to my childhood and I'm going to show and or Mary and Joseph were those kind, patient teachers. Jesus said, I'm going to replicate that with you. Here's an interesting thing. Uh, very quickly, let's just go back to Matthew chapter 4. Verse 21. We're almost done. A little farther than the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sending a boat with their father, Zebedee. Zeb. Zebedee. <laughs> Why did Matthew put that little note there? Could it have been that Zebedee and his two sons were sitting there talking about the kingdom of God, that it must be on hand, it's getting ready to appear. I'm willing to believe James and John were saying things like, Dad, You've taught us the scriptures all these years. Sure, we fished for a living, but you've taught us all these scriptures. The book of John chapter 1 says, James and John, Andrew and Peter had already left fishing a year earlier, gone back and become a disciple of, Je a disciple of John the Baptist. John the Baptist introduced them to Jesus. They started following Jesus. They had lost their taste for fishing. They just didn't want to fish anymore. And I think they were sitting there with their dad going, Dad, if Jesus comes by and he says, would you guys like to follow me full time? We're out of here. Sorry, Dad. But you've been training us all these years for what may be getting ready to happen. And so they're out there talking about that. And Jesus comes by and says, James and John, Come follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. That's why they immediately got up and left them. Their hearts had been prepared. They'd already thought about it. And they understood what Jesus was calling them to be. And they talked it over with their dad. Luke tells us before they left, they threw their net over in the side of the boat. They got this big old load of fish. And so when they left, there was this big load of fish. Jesus <laughs> leaving Zebedee with some fish to sell to replace the four boys that he just took off his mission plate to call <laughs> be preachers. All right, <clears throat> here's our reward. The most incredible interactive and experiential love relationship with the Father and the Son. John chapter 14, this is the end will be done. Oh, yeah. You people are so... Wonderful. To listen to this so intently. John fourteen twenty. At that day you will know 
This is one of the most complex verses in the whole Bible. That that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The crown jewel is knowing the Father and his Son, Jesus. And that interactive relationship between us and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we, we've just covered a lot of stuff here today. We, we, we've gone through lots of things. <clears throat> uh, all this introduces us to what's ahead, to the scriptures ahead, which are, some of them are going to be complex, going to be hard to work with. We're going to struggle and say, dear God, I can't do this. Dear God, what, does it, what forever does this mean? How can I incorporate this into my life? All these questions and all these things are ahead. But dear Lord, you, through Matthew, have set this incredible invitation to enter into your kingdom with the knowledge that you're going to go alongside us and you're going to show us, you're going to teach us, you're going to lead us, you're going to guide us through all these things that are going to transform our lives so that we might become more like you, thus to enjoy eternity together better. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.